If you're having a good week, praise the Lord. If you're having a bad week, praise the Lord. Job. If you ever read Job, Job just praise the Lord. Ain't nothing else you can do but just honor the Lord. Amen. Morning, Steve and Jenny. Did y'all have a good trip in? Yes, sir. Good deal. Amen. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, and let me figure out where I want to start here. I think, right, no, 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 no. Yeah, we'll start there. All right, 2 Corinthians 11 is our base place, and um, I had prayed about trying to present this, uh, the difference between the real Jesus and the fake Jesus, and um, I prayed about it, and I said, Lord, that's, you know, how do I, how do I describe Jesus? You know, the, I know the Bible gives so many things in the Bible, it's, I could just preach through the whole Bible about Jesus and how the Bible describes Jesus. There's one, one thing in particular about Jesus Christ that I think sets him apart from all of the other Jesuses that are out there, the imposter Jesuses. There's one thing that I think sets them apart out there that the cults don't believe. Okay, the cults don't believe it. Uh, but anyway, let's read this. Uh, in verse 3, I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And we were looking at this aspect of, there's two sons in the Bible. There is the son of righteousness, um, the son of God, and then there is the son of Belial, the son of Satan, the child of the devil, and things like that. And we had been kind of going through this, this thing of a son of Belial, what is that? And what does the Bible say about that? And it's interesting, if you look that up in the Bible, if you look up the word Belial, it'll give you all the variances like son of Belial, daughter of Belial, children of Belial, things like that. And then it identifies a characteristic of someone who is after Satan, who is after the working of Satan, and not after the working of the Holy Ghost. 1 Samuel 25 is an example. Now therefore know and consider what, what thou do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. A son of Belial, someone who is after the working of Satan, he cannot be witnessed to, he cannot be approached, he cannot be, his mind cannot be changed. Um, a, this, in this particular case here is Nabal, and his heart was so hardened that he just, he cannot, he cannot be approached, he cannot be speak, spoken to, especially about the things of God. He can't, you cannot deal with him. And I have, I'll never forget, I was in a, a place one time, I was uh, talking to a young lady out at Richwoods about being baptized. She had uh, come to the Lord, I think, during a vacation Bible school, and uh, so I was going to go out and talk to her about baptism. So I was out there in her house with her mom, and... Uh, uh, was, you know, just talking about the Lord. And really, I was just kind of trying to plant seeds in her mother. So her mother says, hang on a second, I want to get her dad in here. And her dad came in, and boy, I mean, he got up against the wall like this, and he was like this. Okay, you kind of read people's body language. Okay, this is a fist. Okay, they're making a fist. They're making a, I'm not, they're, they're putting their barriers up. And they're saying, they're saying to you, I don't want to hear it. So when he did that, I just kind of said, well, it had been kind of explaining to your wife, you know. And then I just kind of went through some of the things very quickly. And I watched him. I watched his demeanor. And I said something about coming to church. And he looked at me and he said, I know where your church is. If I want to come there, I'll come there. But other than that, leave me alone. Just like that. And I said, okay. And uh, I will. 
And I walked out there with the deacon there of the church. We walked out, and I said, Kevin, I think we ought to shake the dust off our feet and let this man alone, okay? It's funny that they'll, he'll, they'll go, that family will go looking for the preacher when the funeral time comes, okay? But other than that, they don't want anything to do with it, okay? Son of Belial cannot be spoken to. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 22 then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial. People who are trying to fake Christianity or let's say um, a, the, the man of sin himself who is posing as Christ will not have anything to do with righteousness. He will be a very, very wicked person. David Koresh. Does anybody know who that is? Okay. He is another Jesus. When he got all those, they were Seventh Day Ad. They were a, a spinoff of the Seventh Day Adventist cult, and it is a cult. And um, they, he had spun off from them, and had built his own compound out there in Waco, Texas. And he had, he started working those people, trying to convince them that he was the Messiah, that he was the Second Coming. He had this Christ. Many shall come in my name, saying, "I am Christ," and shall deceive many. That's what Jesus said. So he started presenting himself this way, but the truth be known, he was sleeping with those women and those young girls out there, and uh, that's a man of sin. That is a man who is a man of Belial, and he's wicked, and he cannot be changed. He cannot be, uh, he's reprobate in his mind, conscience seared with a hot iron, and his acts and his uh, the things that he does is very, very wicked. That is who he is. 1 Samuel 10, 27. The children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. And they were talking about David. Sons of Belial, children of Belial, daughters of Belial, they will reject the salvation of Christ on the cross. They will reject it. In other words, the work of the cross... In coming out of their mouth, the work of the cross is not sufficient to save men's souls. When I think about that, I think about the Roman Catholic Church. How they tell everybody, yes, we believe Jesus died for the sins of mankind, but there is, a, there is an earthly price that you must pay and you must perform certain acts of penance to pay for a portion of your own sins. In other words, they are saying, how can Jesus save you from all of your sins? You must save yourself from part of your sins. That's why they use the, the uh, teaching of purgatory, and they hold that over everybody's head saying, if you don't do good, if you don't pay us money, if you don't do uh, things for the church, then you're going to spend more time in, in purgatory purging off all of those sins that Christ didn't die for. They reject the total sanctification work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He either died for it all or he didn't die for any of it. There is no partial payment with, with God. Amen? It's either paid or it's not paid. Amen? Second uh, Samuel 23, 6, But the sons of Belial shall all of them be as thorns thrust away. I want you to think about that. In, in, you're in 2 Corinthians uh, 12. Paul talks about, um, oh, let's see here. Where am I thinking of here? Yeah, verse uh, 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Thorns in the Bible represent the curse of sin. They represent the curse of man's transgressions and thorns are a picture of the Antichrist. And so a son of Belial is as a thorn thrust away, cannot be taken out with hands. And here Paul identifies the thorns as a, as a messenger of Satan, like an angel, a spirit, a devil, in, in other words. So that's, that's that issue there. 2 Samuel 16, 7. I'm kind of running through this fast because I've got some things I want to show you about Christ. I'm get, I get to where I get tired of talking about the devil and talk about Jesus. 2 Samuel 16, 7. And thus said Shimei, when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou man of Belial. The man of Belial is a bloody man. In other words, he is a, he is a warrior. And all he is is about fighting and, and killing. Uh, that man in Vegas that shot up all that people, he is a man of Belial. 
He is a son of Belial. Something happened in his life that just seared his conscience. They found, I was looking at the news this morning, they released, when one of the agents busted in that room, they saw a handwritten note over on the, uh, I guess the table there by the bed, and they examined it and they released it uh, this weekend, and it was his notes where he was writing down, like a sharpshooter would, he is writing down the, how many yards the people were away and doing his calculations for the trajectory of his bullets. It's premeditated, conscience seared with a hot iron. He has no conscience whatsoever. He's going to kill those people no matter what. He was trying to blow up fuel tanks that were beyond that. They found bullet holes in fuel tanks there, and they found tannerite in his room where he was going to, you tannerite that stuff, you put it on something, you shoot it with a bullet, and it blows up. He could have, he could have killed a lot more people than he did. But he, he is a man of Belial, a bloody man, and has no conscience. Second Samuel 20, verse 1, And there happened to be a man of Belial whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite, and he blew a trumpet and said, Watch this, we have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. In other words, they boldly identify themselves as not being part, partakers with Jesus Christ. That's who that is. When you have no part in David and no, have no inheritance in the son of Jesse, the son of Jesse is Christ. And in Ezekiel 37, the Bible refers to Jesus at his second coming as David. He said, David the king is going to rule over you. So these people will boldly identify, they will identify their salvation and their inheritance as being part of something else, but not the work of Jesus Christ. 1 Kings 21.10, And set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God. This is the story of Naboth and his vineyard. Sons of Belial will not bear witness with Jesus. In other words, they will not bear witness with the Bible. They will witness against the Bible. What does that sound like? Well, your Bible says this, but I say the Bible says something else. They'll bear witness against it. When they brought Jesus up before the Sanhedrin, they brought in false witnesses against this. Is, Nabal is a type of Christ. They brought in false witnesses against Jesus. The Bible says that two, they finally found two men to testify against Jesus, but their witness agreed not with each other. And I'll, ne and I'll never forget, I was sitting there listening to Chris Pinto talk about the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus manuscripts, the Greek documents that underlie all these new Bibles. And I'm sitting there thinking, and he put that verse up on the screen, I said, that's it. That's it. Here you have the Vaticanus, the Sinaiticus, separated by hundreds of miles distance from each other, and they do not agree. They are the, the renderings of the New Testament in Greek, and their witness does not agree with each other. These two documents and the words that they have don't agree into the thousands of places. Through over 3,000 places just in the four Gospels alone where they do not agree with each other as to what the Bible should say. And yet, it is those two documents that are heavily relied upon when it comes to these guys translating and then coming out with these new Bibles. Well, if you've got documents and witnesses of Christ that do not agree with each other, they are not of God. They are, they are the documents of Belial. They're the working of Satan. Somebody say amen. 2 Chronicles 13, 7, And there gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belial, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Vain men. They are all about vanity. That's that crowd that says, Oh, you can be rich. Oh, you can be healthy. Oh, you can live a healthy lifestyle. Oh, you, God can give you health. God can give you wealth. And all. Let me tell you something. That stuff is vanity. So what if God heals your back? Oh, God, heal my back. Amen. I, you know what? I'm not against that. But you're going to die anyway. If God healed a part of your body, that is great news, but you're still going to die. 
The greatest healing that a person can have is heaven. That healing lasts forever. But this crowd will emphasize, listen to me now, this is, this is Joel Osteen. Your best life now is, he is a son of Belial. Because he is all about the vanity of this world. And how God blesses you here, and you can have it all here. Bunch of nonsense. And believe it or not, those guys are real popular in third world countries like India, Pakistan, Kenya, places like that. It is popular amongst the poorest people in the world who don't have the advantages and the opportunities that we have here because they're going over there making promises to these people that if they'll perform and they'll say all these things and do all this stuff that they tell them to do, that they'll be rich. And these people are falling for it. And, I hate, and every time I go over there, I say, be careful about preachers coming to you from America. I'm one of them, and I'm telling you, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. That's who the children, they're very vain. Paul confronted one in Acts chapter 13. This man was Elimus, the sorcerer. There's a clue right there that you do not have the real Jesus. He will practice, I believe the Antichrist and the false prophet will practice a form of sorcery. And witchcraft. Chanting spells, incantations. Songs repeated over and over and over and over again. That, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Praise and worship music. This stuff that nobody, nobody knows half the songs that they're singing anymore because they're bringing all these new ones in about every three or four months. And the ones they do, they'll have, they'll have two or three of them that are a repetition of phrases over and over and over. You watch out for that stuff. Okay? That is a way to lull people into a situation where their mind is susceptible to suggestion. It's near hypnosis. It's what it is. And that's designed that way. And Jesus said, don't do that. Okay? But anyway, here's Elimus the sorcerer. And he is working, he is actively working behind the scenes against Paul to make sure that uh, Sergius Paulus who is a deputy in that area, does not hear the truth of the gospel. They'll work against the gospel and not with the gospel. And so Paul confronted him and he said, All full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, the enemy of righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? The right ways of the Lord is sitting there in your lap. And they will always try to pervert the right ways of the Lord. That is a child of the devil. What well, strong stuff, isn't it? Okay. Uh, he is a son. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, Let the man deceive you by any means. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Perdition is hell. Now I want you to think about where he comes from. The beast in Revelation 13. Revelation 17 says he comes up out of the pit. Uh, um, Revelation 9-11 said he's the king of the bottomless pit. Revelation 13 says he's coming up out of the sea. So think about it. When a child is born, he literally is coming out of the sea. Because the woman's water in her womb is salt water, like the ocean. The baby's swimming around in the sea. Okay? The earth is always depicted as a woman. And at the heart of the earth, that's where hell is. That's where perdition is. The flames of perdition. And this is where he comes from. Who in here has ever heard of the phoenix? Okay, what is it? What is the phoenix? Right. It regenerates itself, it dies in the flames, and then is resurrected out of the ashes of those flames and is alive again. The phoenix is the Antichrist. Because that matches exactly where the Antichrist is coming from, where the beast is coming from. He's rising up out of the flames, out of the ashes. Catholic priests putting ashes on everybody's head. 
That's putting a mark on everybody's forehead. Good grief, what is wrong with those people, amen? Well, if we could just get Bibles in the hands of Catholics, King James Bibles, amen. and say, here, read this. Your priest will tell you not to. I dare you to, amen? But anyway, the son of perdition, he literally is born of hell itself. She has birthed him. Child of the devil, son of perdition. Whereas Jerusalem, here's the opposite. Jerusalem is above. Where did Jesus come from? Come down from heaven. So you see the opposite here. I'm moving kind of fast through this. Uh, let's see here. Here's what I want to do. Just because some group or person says Jesus or Yeshua, that does not mean that it is the Jesus of this Bible. Just because they say it. Okay? When you hear these liberals talk about, well, we're just, shouldn't you be like, they tell you to be like Jesus. Jesus loved everybody. You should love everybody. Jesus was tolerant with everybody. You should be tolerant of everybody. Jesus died for everybody's sins. You don't hear that part. Jesus died for sinners. People who do things that are wrong according to God. You don't hear that part from them. You hear liberals talking about the Jesus that loves everybody. That is a different Jesus than the one we believe in. Yes, Jesus loved them. And he loved them enough to die for their sin. Okay? So, uh, let's see here. Revelation 13. Turn your Bibles there. Revelation 13. I want to tell you something. The stuff that people are sending me about what's going on in this world, you would not believe it. Maybe I should show you some of this stuff. Maybe I should show you how one of the executives at Google is making his own religion. And it's a religion worshiping the God of artificial intelligence. Okay? Because we're making that God right now. Okay? When a computer plays chess, who in here knows how to play chess? Okay? Chess to me is very... Con I'd rather play... I'd, if I'm going to lose a game, I'd rather lose real fast. That's why I play checkers. Okay? If Frankie's going to beat me at something, he's going to beat me at checkers. Amen? Oh, I miss that guy. But anyway... Chess is one of those games that can take days to play it, okay? And there's so many moves out there. And when a computer plays chess, when you make a move, the computer then analyzes every possible move that can be made to the end of the game and determines what best way to counter that move. What best strategy to go against that move? And this IBM computers that are very fast, Watson is one of them, they play out in their mind linearly every move that can be done. It would take a man weeks to do that. A very skilled player would take him weeks to do that. It takes a computer maybe an hour or two or three or something, depending on how complicated the move is and, and their strategy and, and, and how fast the computer is. Quantum computers, this new type of computer that they're working on, when it analyzes all of the possibilities, it does not, it does not analyze them one at a time, one after another. Quantum computers have the ability to analyze all of them at the same time. Remember, yeah. You remember when Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth? You know how he did it? In a moment of time. He was able to show Jesus it's because he's in a higher dimension than we are. Okay? I can look at the whole of a piece of paper all at once. That's how I can do it. It's because I'm this far above it. In quantum computers, the devil showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of the earth at all at the exact same time. Quantum computers can 
run out every possible scenario and do it all nearly instantaneously. With that kind of power, that's a God. That is the power that a God has. Humans, humans have the power to look at all of the moves, but it takes weeks or months. Quantum computers, artificial intelligence, they're gearing toward being able to look at every scenario all at once in a moment of time. Okay? These things that they're building, I don't think the movies have figured out just how advanced these computers are going to end up being. Okay? Anyway, in Revelation 13, the false prophet, let's go back a little bit. Verse 12, he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. See, he's the phoenix. He had a wound, and he's in the fire, and he's resurrected out of that fire. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which did had the wound by a sword and did live. In verse 15, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Everything your Bible says about idols, the Bible says that idols have mouth, but they cannot talk. They have ears, they cannot hear, arms cannot save. They have feet and legs, but they cannot walk. They have to be carried around. This image is going to be different than every other image that's ever been made in the earth. It is going to have the ability to speak on its own, independent. When you, talk, when you call these call centers and you get that computer voice on the phone, okay, that computer voice is listening to you and is making a choice about what to re how to respond based upon a list of pre-designed responses, pre-recorded, pre-designed responses, okay? This image of the beast does not have the ability to speak because man gave him the words to speak. He is going to speak on his own, not what man tells him to say. He is going to say what he wants to say, okay? That's different than any other thing that we've ever encountered before, all right? Zechariah 11, let me put that on the screen for you. Woe to the idle shepherd. Idle shepherd. That is that. That's your idle shepherd. Do not put that on my coffin. Okay? Don't put that. Let's not have a big standing Jesus somewhere surrounded by flowers. Okay? That's a grove. Some of you cut it down. Amen? But the idle shepherd... Leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm, upon his right eye, his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. His right eye, I believe, is darkened because the right eye represents where the power of God is, that's where Jesus is, that's where the book is. When the right eye is darkened, you cannot see. You cannot see the New Testament. You cannot see salvation by grace. You can only see the Old Testament and the curse of the law. Okay, so that's, that's how he's going to rule. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 15 God said take you therefore good heed unto yourselves for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in horror out of the midst of the fire lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image the similitude of any figure the likeness of male or female He's, a similitude is something that is similar to that and God said you, you did not see me you did not see what I look like therefore there shall be no idols anywhere in the land of Israel that says this is Jehovah God this is the God that met us at Mount Sinai. You don't know what I look like. You, you cannot see my face. I, I didn't even see, let Moses see my face. And do not carve out. If you carve out an image and put Jesus on there, I'll know you are lying. Because you do not know what I look like. Uh, here is the image of Jesus. Here's what he looks like. Revelation 19, 13. He was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. The image of Jesus that we have is right here. This is what he looks like. Read it. Read it. You want to, you want to be able to identify the real Jesus and know the fake Jesus, read the book. 
Study the image that he gave us to study. Know this Bible. Know enough about it to where you can spot the fake one coming from a long distance. Everybody else saying, oh, it's the Messiah, it's Jesus, it's Yeshua, HaMashiach. And you're going, no, no it ain't. I can see it from here, I can tell you from here that it's not, amen? You'd be able to know it from a long distance away and warn everybody. He said in the law, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. The imaginations of man carve an image of Jesus that does not appear as the same image the Bible gives us. So he's always going to be different, all right? Here's the Catholic Jesus. The Catholic Jesus, he is forever dying on the cross. He never makes it off that cross. Okay, that's the Catholic one. The Muslim Jesus, called Isa. According to the Muslim faith, that Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to shout to everybody in the world that they should have been Muslim all along. There, he's going to say, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. That's what he's going to tell everybody. Isa, get ready now, when Barack Obama asked Rick Warren to, to say the prayer of blessing at Obama's first inauguration, I was watching it. I'll never forget it. Rick Warren closes the prayer and he says, in the name of Isa. Not making that up. He's a sellout, by the way. Here's the Mormon Jesus. The Mormon Jesus went and visited the native tribes in North America and he said, you're the lost tribes of Israel. Didn't y'all know that? And he had him write out another testament of Jesus Christ. Another. See, the other Jesus is not going to bring in the same gospel. It's going to bring a different gospel. A different way of receiving blessing from God. That's what, so the other Jesus is going to bring in the other gospel. That's all, that all works hand in hand. Here's the uh, Jehovah's Witness Jesus. Jehovah's Witness, they're adamant about this. And they'll fight you over it. Jesus did not die on a cross. He died on a stick or a pole. Okay? Now, I don't know where in the world that's going. I don't know where they get it. But see, that denies the teaching that's in the New Testament of the glory of the cross. It was a cross, amen. It wasn't a stick or a pole. By the way, the Jehovah's Witness Jesus is not God. Here's the Seventh-day Adventist Jesus. He has one eye. Dun, dun, dun. Think about it. The idle shepherd had his right eye darkened. Means he cannot see grace, the grace of the New Testament. The salvation that the Seventh-day Adventist church brings to the table is not the gospel of free grace. It is the gospel of worship on Saturday. The fourth commandment. Um, what's her name? Ellen White, who started the Seventh-day Adventist organization, was in contact with a familiar spirit posing as an angel from heaven. And this angel from heaven took her to heaven where she saw the glory of God and she saw the Ten Commandments inscribed on a wall and they was all just glittery gold and glory coming out of it. And she said... The glory of nine commandments was not as bright as the glory of the fourth commandment, which is, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And she said, that glory shines above all the other commandments. And she said, Jesus nailed to the cross nine of the commandments, but the fourth one is still in, in position and you must obey the fourth commandment or you're not going to heaven. That's that right eye darkened. It's the, not the same Jesus. Here's the Hebrew roots Jesus. They cut, did the bell ring? I got to get through this. Bear with me. They call him Yeshua. They call him everything. They will not call him Jesus because they say that is a pagan word. And they will not call him that. 
They don't call him the Alpha and the Omega either. Jesus said in Greek, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That is the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. You ought to hear these people talk. They said, well, the original New Testament was originally written in, in Hebrew, and it would have said, I am the Aleph Tov, not that Alpha and the Omega. Jesus never said, he never said that. You'll search the Old Testament. He never said, I am the Aleph Tov. It's in the New Testament. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Why? Because when you have a New Testament, it's in a new language for, for new people. All right? Anyway, I got I to tell you this part very quickly. They call him the Aleph Tov, and they say that the Hebrew letters are pictograms. Each Hebrew letter has its own separate meaning. And you take a Hebrew word and dissect its letters, and the letters of each Hebrew word will tell its own story. It's like a mystical teaching, like you wouldn't know it if you didn't know this. And they said the Aleph is God, and the Aleph is drawn like an ox, and it means strength. And what they've done is that they've changed the glory of God into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. That's right out of your King James Bible. They changed Jesus into the golden calf. That's your Hebrew roots people right there. Can I hear God's people say amen? Father, we ask your blessings, Lord, on this. Lord, I wanted to be able to just tell everybody who Jesus was. And Lord, just prepare us for that. Lord, there's glory in that. And I pray, dear God, that you would open up people's eyes. People that are being deceived. People that are being lied to. People that are worshiping and falling for Another Jesus that is not the Jesus of this Bible. And Father, we thank you, God, Lord, that you have shown us the truth. Help us, dear God, to not be proud, not be arrogant or cocky in that. Help us, dear God, in that our, the only glory that we have is in what Christ did and not what we do and not what we have. Father, humble us. Humble us before the cross. Remind us, dear God, of the pit that you dug us out of. But Father, we thank you for the real Jesus, who died for all of our sins, we thank you, God, for the blessing of salvation and the gospel. Help us as a church, help us as people to preach it everywhere and to teach it and to show forth the goodness of God. Thank you, Father, for this good lesson. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. He's not an ox.